Hello, my name is Ms. Miller. I teach IB Physics in Arlington, Virginia at Washington Lee High School. And today we are going to be diving into IB Physics Year 2, the first unit, Electricity and Magnetism. Uh, today we're going to cover electric charge, moving charges, and electric force both qualitatively and quantitatively. Now this is kind of a big shift for us in IB Physics. Year one focused a lot about the macroscopic world, the everyday objects that you can see, a ball being thrown, a car driving by. Now we're diving into the microscopic world. So we're going to be talking about charges that we can't actually see in and of themselves, but we can see the effects of those charges. So to start us off, what exactly is charge? Well, you're probably familiar with protons and electrons and neutrons. Protons are the positive charges, electrons the negative charges, and neutrons, of course, are the neutral charges. In physics, we're going to use the variable Q, either a capitalized Q or a lowercase Q, to represent charge. The units for charge are going to be coulombs or a capital C. So in physics, uh, we can have, you know, just one positive charge, one negative charge, an isolated proton or electron, but more often than not, we're going to talk about net charges or a combination of charges. For example, uh, you have kind of this sphere on the far left that has six positive charges, so it must mean six protons and six negative or six electrons. So the net charge of this object would be, you guessed it, a net neutral charge. The middle sphere, however, has eight positive charges and six negative charges. You'll see here that there are more positives than negative, so we would call this a net positive charge. And finally, our last sphere on the far right, we have six positive charges and nine negative charges. The negatives are winning out. We would call this a net negative charge. Let's talk about uh, moving charges. So, one of these charges, protons, electrons, or neutrons, can move. And we're going to try to reason through why just one of them can move. You may recognize this diagram right here, the Bohr model of an atom. We have the neutrons and protons kind of stuck in the nucleus, bound together. And then you have your uh, various electron shells on the outside. In addition to that, we have the masses of electrons, protons, and neutrons listed out here. We also have the radii of an electron, a proton, and a neutron. So I, I want you to pause for a moment and uh, just think to yourself, with the information given on the screen, which of these charges do you think moves and why do you think it moves? If you were thinking that the electron was the charge that moves, you would be correct. You'll notice in the diagram up here that electrons are on the outside. They're not stuck in the nucleus like the neutrons and protons. They're easy to kind of rip off and join in with another atom passing by or to gain more electrons coming in. You'll also notice that the electron has a mass that is 10 to the negative 31st kilograms, whereas the protons and neutrons have mass on the order of 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. This means that electrons are much lighter than the protons and neutrons. A lighter mass means that it would be easier to move. Finally, electrons are also going to be the tiniest of our three particles. They're coming in with a radius on the order of 10 to the negative 16th, whereas protons and neutrons are larger, around 10 to the negative 15th meters. So it is for these three reasons that electrons can move and protons and neutrons can't. Again, to recap, Electrons are on the outside, they are not stuck in the radi or stuck in the nucleus. They're tiny and they're light. So knowing that, let's come back to our example. Now we know that we had a net neutral object, a net positive object, and a net negative object. Let's now put this into terms of losing or gaining electrons. Let's focus on our net positive here, because the net neutral obviously hasn't lost or gained anything. The net positive object, you'll notice that there are more positives than negatives. So you might be tempted to say that this object has gained protons. But of course, we know that protons can't move, only electrons can. So instead, we would reframe this and say that this object has lost electrons. Somehow, maybe another object came by and rubbed a few off. This object has lost two electrons. Our third example here over on the far right, we have six positives and nine negative charges. 
Again, you may be tempted to say that this object has lost protons because there are fewer positives. However, we know that protons can't move, only electrons can. Therefore, we would say that this object has gained electrons. Now you may remember from previous science classes that not all materials can uh, allow electrons to move easily. We call materials where electrons do move easily conductors. These are going to be most metals that you encounter. Looking at the atomic makeup, you'll notice that there's this free electron on the outside that's really easy to rip off, you know, by another passing object. Or uh, conductors can also readily take on electrons and um, absorb them into their electron levels. Insulators, however, are materials where electrons do not move very easily. Examples of insulators are glass, plastic, rubber, air, and you'll notice looking at the atomic makeup for insulators, uh, they're, they're pretty complete. They don't really need an electron to complete one of their electron shells, and they don't have that free electron kind of hanging out there to give away. So let's start to talk about how charges affect one another. We're going to start by talking qualitatively and then come back and talk about this quantitatively. Qualitatively, we have the golden rule of electrostatics that opposite charges will attract and like charges will repel. I kind of remember this by thinking about Romeo and Juliet. They're opposites and of course they attract. What this comes down to is if you have a positive and a positive, these would be an example of like charges, they would feel a repulsive force. A negative and negative also feel a repulsive force. And opposite charges, a positive and a negative, would feel an attractive force. Now, you may be wondering, well, where do neutral objects come into play? And the answer is neutral objects can still feel a force. I'm going to go to this simulation right here and uh, give you a little example of what this might look like. So here's the simulation that was in the presentation. Uh, you'll notice that we have this sweater over here, a balloon in the middle, and a wall over at the right. I'm first going to take my balloon and I'm going to rub it on the sweater. You'll notice that as I rub the balloon on the sweater, the negatives, the electrons, are going to transfer over to the balloon. Now, of course, we know that electrons are the only charge that moves, so you'll notice that the protons, the positives, have stayed in, in, in their spot. Now, looking at the sweater, you have an excess of protons and no electrons to balance it out. So the sweater would be a net positive object. Looking at the balloon, we now have more negatives than positives, so we have a net negative object. So a net positive sweater, a net negative balloon, these are oppositely charged, and so they should attract. So let's shift our attention over here to the wall. Now, if you notice, when I bring up my balloon near the wall and try to rub electrons off, well, nothing really happens. This wall must be made out of some sort of insulator, insulating material that doesn't readily give up its electrons or take any on. Well, there is still a way to get the wall to feel the effects, a repulsive or attractive force, of the charges here. Let me charge up my balloon again, so I have a net negative balloon. And I'm going to bring this balloon close to the wall. Notice what's happening to the negative charges within the wall. Those negative charges within the wall are repelling from the net negative charge of the balloon. After all, like charges will repel. Notice that the positives of the wall are not doing anything. They are stuck in that nucleus. They cannot move. So when I let go of the balloon, you'll see that it actually stays on the wall. It attracts to the wall. It's as if, since all of the little negatives have run away to the right side of the wall, it's as if the left side of the wall looks like it's net positively charged. Net negatively charged balloon net positively charged side of the wall, opposites will attract and the balloon will attract over to the wall. Now you have kind of this net positive left side of the wall and this net negative right side of the wall. For this reason, we call this process polarization, as in there's a positive pole and a negative pole, just like we might say there's a north pole and a south pole for the world. It's very important to note that if you were to count up all of the charges, all of the positives and the negatives on the wall itself, 
Well, this is a net neutral object, both when the balloon is not touching it yet and when the balloon is touching it. So to answer our question in the presentation, net neutral objects can feel the effects of charges. They can feel this attractive force um, that we will eventually call the electric force. So at this point, we have now talked about how um, charges can affect each other qualitatively. And now we're gonna move on to the quantitative, trying to stick a number to how much force these charges would feel when brought near each other. For this, we're gonna use Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says that the force, the electric force, F, is equal to KQQ over R squared. Here, K stands for Coulomb's constant. It's given in your data booklet, and it is 8.99 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Again, you do not need to memorize this number. It is in your data booklet on the constants page. Then you have Q and Q. This is going to be your first charge and your second charge. Divided by R squared. R here stands for the distance between the charges. This law can be expressed in another way as well. Instead of expressing the law in terms of K, Coulomb's constant, K can be replaced with 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. This substitution is also listed in your data booklet. This new variable, epsilon naught, stands for the permittivity constant. More often than not, the permittivity constant will be for free space, and that is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. This is a value that is also listed in your data booklet. Now, this value, the permittivity constant, will change for different mediums. So if this was all taking place in water or in plastic, you would have to be very conscious of changing that permittivity constant from free space to whatever would be given in the problem. Again, more often than not, you'll be using permittivity constant for free space unless you're told otherwise in a problem. Returning to the patterns that you learned in IB Physics Year 1, we can start to see a relationship between the force and the distance between the charges. Here, force and the distance between the charges follows an inverse square relationship. On this slide, you'll see three proportional reasoning questions. What would happen to the force if the distance between the charges was doubled? What about if it was tripled? What about if it was quadrupled? Take a moment to record your answers. If you said that the force would be one quarter as much if the distance were doubled, you would be correct. Now, if you were doubling the distance, you would need to remember that the distance is on the bottom and it's squared. So that's how we got the 1 over 4 or 1 over 2 squared here. That's pretty incredible. If you take two charges and you put them twice as far apart, the force is going to decrease by 1 fourth. If the distance were to be tripled, well, the force is going to be 1 ninth of what it used to be. And if the distance were quadrupled four times as far apart, then the force is only going to be 1 16th as much as it used to be. So you can see that the force is going to drop off the further away your charges are from each other. This may remind you quite a lot of that universal law of gravitation that you learned in IB Physics Year 1. You have force, either electric force or gravitational force is equal to a constant, either k or g, times the things creating the force, so charge 1 and charge 2, or mass 1 and mass 2 for gravity, divided by the distance between either the charges or the masses. Both of these laws will follow an inverse square relationship between the force and the distance. So let's try a few examples. Our first example here is what is the force that one proton and one electron exert on each other when placed just two meters apart? First, I want you to think about this problem qualitatively. Will these charges attract or repel? Then I want you to try quantitatively solving for exactly how much force there will be. 
Pause the video here and record your answers.